Hello, I'm Samina Mullah, and this talk is Nursing Sexual Violence from the Stand, Victimized and Victimizing Bodies. And I'm going to do my best to be a one-take wonder because my uh, technological <laughs> bag of tricks is rather limited. So uh, thanks for uh, bearing with me. Um, and thank you very much for this invitation. And I I'm just so sorry that it's pandemic times and we're not able to meet in person. Nevertheless, I'm happy to share some of my research with you today. So I'm gonna start with a quote uh, from a sexual assault um, nurse examiner. And I will use the term sexual assault nurse examiner or sane nurse and forensic nurse interchangeably. And one of the nurses I interviewed said to me, I think most of my patients are frustrated if I don't see any trauma. And I try to explain to them that that's normal. That's typically what we see. That doesn't mean something didn't happen to you. There's just nothing here right now. And I think that's hard to deal with when you feel like you've, you've been violated, especially if they're having pain of any kind. It's like, wait a minute, I'm hurting. There's got to be something there. Please tell me there's something to justify my story. And unfortunately, most of the time there's not. So what this talk focuses on is the labor performed by sexual assault nurse examiners, specifically how the labors and expertise they enact in clinics are now drawn into the courtroom in US sexual assault prosecutions. My field site was the city of Milwaukee where I observed collectively with my collaborator, Heather Holovka and our research assistant, Amber Powell, 676 court appearances at many stages of sexual assault prosecution, including 34 full jury trials. In the courtroom, the same nurse emerged as a complicated central witness called to corroborate victims' narratives. Considering courtrooms as sites of discussion, conversation, and the raising of questions around sexual violence, we might begin by thinking of what norms of speaking about sexual violence define its entry into legal institutional processes. And so here, you know, I'll offer a few of the types of things I discuss at length um, when I'm teaching these materials with my students. I sometimes offer jokingly that US culture uh, really often shows its puritanic roots when it comes to issues related to sexual health and um, uh, sexual violence in the sense that uh, even on good days, we can barely have uh, comfortable conversations uh, among peer groups about um, healthy sexuality and issues related to sexual expression. And this is deeply uh, kind of uh, confounded and made even more complicated when we introduce questions of um, sexual coercion and sexual violence, right? And so this is one sort of facet about um, US culture, we're very puritanic when it comes to issues related to sexuality. We do tend to speak about issues related to sexual health and sexuality only with our peer groups. Um, and the court is quite the opposite of that as an intensely structured public space. Our peer group is oftentimes defined by age and the courtroom is definitionally often a space of intergenerational um, participation and finally, I should say, we know quite a, a lot about uh, the ways in which uh, people within intimate relationships, which are consensual, talk about consent uh, and sexual relationships. And we know very little about uh, what that talk might sound like outside uh, of those boundaries. And courtrooms give us you know, one way to think about the way these discussions are really um, brought into a much more uh, kind of publicly accessible and publicly visible space. And I will say that, uh, you know, some of the research that informs our discussions around sexual health absolutely is from the um, sexual education literature, right, which um, is oddly mappable onto the space of the courtroom in the sense uh, that you'll see that the nurse takes a very didactic approach to how she talks about the jury. She's educating them. And this is in fact what we see in the sexual health literature. And this is one form of um, intergenerational sometimes conversation that might actually be comfortable where you have an educator who is imparting some information. 
Um, so all of these things sort of animate my approach towards analyzing what it is that's going on in the courtroom. And in this talk, I'm gonna offer insights into how the nurse with her professional expertise is the primary narrator of sexual harm to the victimized body into the court record. While the victimizing body is not narrated by the nurse at all, it's narrated into the court record through a broader range of voices. The nurse's expertise, I will show, leaves in place many of the normative understandings of feminized bodies, though it challenges some conventions in order to make way for the trier of fact, in most cases in the US, a jury, to recognize evidence or to understand the absence of evidence. So one of the primary functions of the exam um, was to evidence sexual assault in allegedly technical and scientific criteria. Most often called as a witness for the prosecution, the nurse was interpolated into the trial to produce the dialectical tension between narrativized experience and material objectivity, um, even when no such evidence materialized. And so what I mean by this uh, dialectical tension is the nurse in terms of the trial is typically the um, third or fourth even later um, witness in a typical sexual assault prosecution in insofar as there is one like that. And um, the victim witness is the person who was her patient is typically one of the earliest. Um, and where that testimony is typically, you know, incredibly personal and sometimes quite emotional um, and based on the experiences of the, of the victim, what the nurse offers uh, is something that corroborates those experiences, but is uh, very contrasting in the sense that it's produced in a much more clinical register, which I'm gonna talk a lot about. Um, so the same nurse uh, was charged with also performing her own credibility and objectivity. She was asked to focus on protocols and procedures, evidence collection and report verification. Scholars such as Patricia Yancey Martin, Rose Corrigan, and others have documented the growth of SANE programs and protocols across the US. In response to identified gaps in patient care, SANE nurses receive specialized training in trauma and rape, evidence collection techniques, and court testimony preparation. Nurses often portrayed the forensic examination as an intimate encounter requiring sensitivity and discretion. In our interviews with nurses, they collectively described how they met the medical, psychological, and forensic needs of their patients while maintaining their commitments to what the criminal justice system required. Such needs often included emotional support and advocacy, diagnostic testing, vaccinations, blood and urine testing, STI screenings, along with forensic examinations, which included mapping injuries onto a body map, other forms of documentation, evidence collection, and forensic photography. From the stand, nurses spoke about their interactions with the victim as documented in reports explaining the evidence collected, documented injuries, care protocols, and victim statements and demeanor. Sexual assault nurses downplayed or omitted the invasiveness, the time commitment, and the pain that might accompany the exam. Rather, testimony tended to solely focus on genital anatomy lessons, and the presence or absence of forensic evidence and injury. As a witness, this, the nurse could be asked to read what she had written in her medical report, including the victim's emotional state and reported details of the assault. Prosecutors had to tread lightly when eliciting information about the patient's affective states during medical examinations. Yet, like the role of police witnesses who have also written about, there was considerable slippage between the nurse and her role as what we consider a fact and expert witness. When forms of evidence are both imagined and foundational, juries come to expect them at trial. Prosecutors can use the increasing expectation of forensic evidence as one of many justifications for avoiding rape trials. Like Rose Corrigan shows, the forensic exam can operate as a trial by ordeal, acting as a proxy for a victim's truthfulness and their commitment to the criminal justice investigation. When the forensic examination itself is cast as trial by ordeal, even those exams that yield no conclusive evidence serve an essential purpose. Indeed, prosecutors in our study often persuasively suggested the victim's resolve by asking jurors during closing statements 
Why would she go through such a harrowing ordeal if she were lying? Such demonstrable commitment simultaneously casts suspicion on those rape victims who decided not to seek medical care or to participate in forensic examination. Sociologist Andrea Quinlan's historical study shows that the sexual assault examination is not a neutral object and reflects and maintains the histories and politics of the worlds of which it is part. Together, Corrigan and Quinlan's work helps to explain why forensic nurses are called to the stand to testify about the absence of evidence more often than its presence. Among the 34 jury trials observed, nurses were called as fact witnesses in only nine cases. Injuries and DNA were present in only a handful. And I wanna contrast uh, these 34 jury trials I saw and the 676 appearances I saw um, with the uh, condition that, you know, at our local sexual assault treatment center that year, there had been over 1,000 cases um, that had uh, been referred for uh, forensic examination. So that should clearly illustrate that most cases do not advance to trial. For most nurses, then, the courtroom and what occurs there is largely experienced as anticipatory. Testifying is an exercise that is imagined during the clinical encounter encounter, but rarely comes to fruition. One nurse uh, that we interviewed explained, when people are interviewed for this job, they absolutely think like we go to court every month or something like that. And then when they hear you can work for this job you, for five years and never go to court, that seems a little shocking to most people. Prosecutors generally found nurses to be credible witnesses in court due to their extensive experience, expertise, and ability to educate the jury about issues related to anatomy and sexual violence. As a highly gendered form of labor, the professional standing of nurses is itself culturally specific. Thus, I assert that the feminization of the field and cultural assumptions about sexual assault nursing motivated defense attorneys to portray nurses as overly subjective, as women often are, um, or as painted, or I should say, are as pa painted as being, and attached to the victim. When nurses testified on the stand, prosecutors often employed a tactic of erasing the nurse's care for her patient, while defense counsel frequently challenged nurses' reports of the victim witness's emotional state as biased. To evacuate their testimony of emotionally charged content, nurses often sanitized sexual assault, portraying a standardized and sterilized victimized body. This modality may be considered an extension of the ways in which nurses undertake dirty work. Um, and I'm drawing here on C. Everett Hughes. Uh, this is a mode of work in which nurses are considered abject figures because of their intimacy with pathologized and contaminated bodies, as well as their subordinated place in the hierarchy of medicine. Prosecutors required nurses to demonstrate their desensitization to blood, semen, and other fluids, and their ease with discussing sex and anatomy, all ways in which nurses could perform detachment and impartiality. Nurses achieved the sanitization of bodies and sexual violence through the routinization of the sexual assault exam itself. These sterile courtroom descriptions stood in contrast with the way nurses described the personalized nature of their nursing care work in our interviews with them. On the stand, nurses often spoke in terms that erased the specificity of a patient's body and discussed anatomy and reproductive health using language that reproduced a universalized heteronormative reproductive history. It is significant that the victim witness's body required this expert interpretation, while the victimizing body was neither medicalized nor explained on the stand with a few exceptions. As I move forward, I will trace how the sexual assault nurse deployed medical legal imaginaries and knowledge to construct the raped body while relying on clinical practices informed by and transported into the legal realm. I contrast this with the ways in which knowledge about victimizing bodies is drawn into the adjudicative process. In both cases, as I said earlier, heteronormative frameworks infuse our cultural norms as nurses testify to the resilience of the female body while signaling the fragility of forensic evidence. Most of the 22 sexual assault nurse examiners interviewed for this project define their role as one that straddled healing work and trauma response. And um, they thought of themselves as, quote, neutral medical professional and collector of forensic evidence. 
More experienced forensic nurses said that newly trained nurses had similar expectations to victim patients about the role of DNA in sexual assault cases. They were often shocked to learn both about the infrequency of documentable injury and that testifying in court often focused on explaining the absence of evidence. The primary utility of DNA lay in identifying a suspect. And this was generally not at issue in sexual assault as most occurred at the hands of a perpetrator known to the victim. Many forensic nurses we interviewed began their careers in emergency care work or obstetrics, moving into uh, sexual assault nursing following their certification. With advanced degrees and extensive training in healthcare, physical anatomy, physiology of the body, and trauma and sexual assault, nurses utilized scientific knowledge central to their fields. In the clinical setting, nurses relied on a range of skills to identify, locate, and describe the evidence they recorded. They often focused on the appearance of the evidence with and without visual aids, describing appearance, size, contours, smells, and the presence of pain as an indicator of injury. These techniques relied heavily on expert sensory attunement to locating, recovering, and describing forensic evidence. The clinical treatment and investigation of the raped body was also the site of cultural production. The statutory structures that privileged visual forms of evidence also prioritized the nurse's approach to collecting and documenting evidence that transformed the patient's voice and pain into written record. Charts, forms, and standards of care are routinized and adopted across the US. As one nurse told us, statewide coordinators train nurses, quote, with tips and the best ways to put on paper, truths, facts, hearsays, all that kind of stuff. You always have to write everything as if you may be going to court. Legally, of course, sexual assault statutes emphasize the use of force and the presence of injury. So while the law did not explicitly require visual evidence, it compelled the use of body diagrams, images, and mappable pelvises in clinical practice. Rarely did these documents and forms capture the burden of sexual violence. Instead, they sanitized, constricted, and codified embodied evidence in the process of institutional subjectification. I'm drawing here on um, Judith Butler's classic notion of subjectification. Joyce, a forensic nurse we spoke with, underscored this peculiar position of meeting clinical and legal standards. She said, we train on how to ask patients questions because obviously they're really personal and very invasive when we're talking about sex. And then also if someone does find an injury on the body, it's important to document them early as far as making sure you have a size, a color, if there's a shape to it, what is the shape? And then asking the patient if they know how they got that because sometimes those are the most powerful things in quotations as far as saying, that's where he punched me. I thought I was going to die. That statement is better versus just having a circle on a chart. Making sure your documentation is thorough, making sure your assessment is good, making sure that everything is documented that possibly can be as far as not leaving any blanks on the chart, not leaving things undone, if you will. Leaving things undone, in fact, was not out of the ordinary. Another experienced nurse revealed that she found errors in every chart she reviewed, including her own. I wish I would have, or I wish I hadn't put that, or I forgot to answer that question, or it looks like I forgot to answer it because I left something blank, so I hate those. I mean, I can find an error with all of my charts. In the case of State versus Logan, the forensic nurse testified that she did not use a colposcope on her patient who was seven years old during her forensic examination. On cross-examination, however, the defense attorney pointed out to her that she had marked the use of a colposcope, which is a kind of visual technology, in her written report. The nurse responded, then that, that must have been my error, I apologize. I should have reviewed and referred to my documentation. And the defense said, but as far as you know today, that was never used. And the nurse said, no, now that I look at it, at this, it probably was used because if I checked it, then yes, then I probably did use it. I shouldn't say probably, I did. Only that which is written in the report becomes available as evidence in court and how it is written is shaped by medical legal conventions. In cases where charts and records deferred from the forensic nurse's memory, the record was deemed more credible, standing in as a data double, not only for the victim, but for the forensic nurse. And the idea of the data double comes to us from um, Don Moore and Rashmi Singh, who talk frequently about how 
in domestic violence cases, when victims recant, oftentimes it's the medical files and the case files, which then stand in when the state decides to move forward with prosecution. So the idea of the data double has been established in relationship to um, the victim witness, and I'm trying to extend it here to also think about sort of nurses being pitted against themselves. Um, Victims might have come to emergency rooms drugged or intoxicated, telling forensic nurses that they could not recall the attack in detail, in which case their narrative was often limited. Nurses described conventions of documentation to justify the clinical transformation of patients' words, such as, quote, it hurts, I don't want to, into patient declined due to discomfort, or unable to do speculum exam because of patient's level of discomfort. While these reports might be less easily challenged in court, the changes make it easier to challenge the victim's narratives, and they introduce a, a possibility that her testimony might contradict the phrasing introduced in the nurse's report. The reports also neutralize the client's emotions and her evaluation of her own body, rendering her voice less credible than the nurse's assessment, and at times less credible than the documents themselves. Now, another nurse deliberated on the unpredictability of photography in forensic examinations. And she said, when there are injuries, I think it's huge to see a photograph of it versus a drawing. And then she re uh, reconsidered. Then again, I think it's hard for jurors to understand there were no injuries. And you're showing a picture of a perfectly normal, healthy area that doesn't look traumatized. And yet you have a victim saying a lot of stuff happened and they might question why there are no injuries. You know, Even though the nurse said this is normal, I think there would have been something. While evidence collection plays a large role in the professional responsibility of forensic nurses, researchers have also demonstrated that the desire to establish oneself as a professional may result in forensic nurses documenting evidence that undermines victims' credibility, even as it enhances nurses' own professional reputation. In the next section, I explore the authorizing domain of the courtroom and delineate some socialization practices, processes of evaluation, and institutionalized ways of seeing and speaking that are transformed into specialized knowledge. So we're going to look at this body map for a while. Just as victim witnesses were required to convey affective demeanor, such as sadness and shame, nurses, like police officers, had to perform a range of qualities such as um, demonstrating their knowledge, authority, objectivity, and impartiality. Prosecutors first established the nurses' education, their degrees obtained, training certifications, and years in clinical practice. How many sexual assault examinations have you performed? What is the peer review process? Are you up to date on your literature and continued training opportunities? Gynecology and obstetrics was one set of expertise. And as we argued, the feminized labors of nursing were observed during courtroom testimony. Prosecutors would then shift seamlessly from nurse credentialing into anatomy lessons, routinely asking, what are some explanations for the lack of injury in most examinations? This question prompted SANES to perform their expertise by explaining their administrative standards, the logics of documents, and customary descriptions of sexed bodies. These explanations often included reproductive narratives about birthing bodies, or potentially birthing bodies, we should say, that suggested the deeply held heteronormative values of the nomos of sexual violence. And by nomos here, I'm referring to uh, the uh, kind of cultural norms um, that we see really animating uh, law and medicine and particularly forensic intervention. Seated in sexual assault trial courtrooms for many months, the most common medical records we saw introduced at trial included examination reports and body maps. Unmarked body maps, like the one that you're looking at, were often centered into evidence early in the nurse's testimony as a visual aid during um, the nurse's anatomy lessons. Science and technology studies scholar Sheila Jasanoff has argued that courts are taught to interpret scientific evidence through practices of visualization. In the trials we observed, prosecutors often provided a body map depicting two views of a vulva, which they referred to consistently as a vagina, which is not the correct scientific nomenclature, in the shorthand of the court, more or less from the perspective of someone standing or sitting between a patient's legs as they are held in stirrups in the traditional uh, lithotomy position or alternately without stirrups in what gynecologists often call the frog position. Now, one of the views on the map included a detailed rendering of the cervix. Um, and from what you're looking at, that's the view on the right. Um, the view on the left is much more common. The view of the cervix can only be achieved during examination using the speculum, which you can see is drawn as part of this picture. But what's really interesting is that the view 
um, I'm sorry, both views I should say can only be achieved um, by um, opening uh, the uh, vaginal canal using the traction of the speculum and you'll see that it's disappeared in the view on the left um, and you can um, still see it on the right. Okay, so, um, and you know, what I'm arguing here is that this representational modality actually normalizes the spectacle of the victimized body, rendering it open to the forensic gaze. The, mod the body map images were neat and simple, as you can see with black line drawings that belied the fleshiness of human bodies, the secretions, the absence of the victim witness during the forensic nurse's testimony due to sequestration further alienated the corporeality of the body from its sanitized renderings. The sequestration order can be said to reproduce the work of the drape in gynecological examinations, separating persons and pelvises. And so I think this is one of the greatest disservices of um, a whole range of fascinating um, trial procedurals is uh, there is almost a cultural convention in which I think we're used to seeing on television and film, uh, the live reactions of um, sexual assault victims during trials when in uh, the American legal system, all witnesses are typically um, subject to sequestration orders, so they cannot hear the testimony of the other witnesses. The two exceptions um, in um, Wisconsin are clearly the defendant, um, who I will talk about, who is present for the entire trial as his, his right, and um, one uh, law enforcement official who is um, appointed the officer of the court who is there to uh, assist the prosecutor and may testify as well as be in the court the whole time. Otherwise, all the other witnesses, including and maybe especially the victim witness, are subject to the sequestration order and they're not in the courtroom when the trial is happening. Now, during these trials, the nurses appeared to have wrote responses to the prosecutor's questions explaining what we were seeing, how we were seeing it, and the way those body parts functioned. When describing the tissue of the vagina, Nurses variously testified that vaginas were, and these are all actual quotes from trials, quote, made to have sexual intercourse often, lubricated, very stretchy, similar to the membrane of the mouth, like a scrunchie in reference to the tool for binding your hair, uh, able to accommodate something the size of a watermelon, this is a reference to giving birth, and a quote, self-cleaning vessel. These descriptions of a lubricated, stretchy, self-cleaning membrane that was likened to the mouth, you know, and here's what one nurse says, think how quickly your mouth heals when you, when you bite it or have a sore. Nurse one asked to jury. These were designed to explain the minimal or total absence of injury following sexual assault, visible injury, I should say. These anatomy lessons were simplified, generalized, and steeped in heteronormative archetypes. The vagina also all was also a symbol of reproduction. For example, in State versus Moore, the forensic nurse was asked by the prosecutor to explain the lack of injury and she began, well, lack of injury can occur from just the makeup, the general makeup of a woman. There's lubrication to the genital area. If someone is fearful, they may not necessarily put up a fight during the assault because they're afraid for their life, depending if there was a weapon. And generally, the body is kind of made to have sexual intercourse, I guess for lack of a better word. So often you will not have injury. The prosecutor asked, would you describe the makeup of the vagina to be a stretchy or rigid part of the body? Very stretchy. Stretchiness was sometimes demonstrated uh, beyond simply being explained. So in the case of the nurse who um, uh, explained that a vagina was like a scrunchie, she actually once removed the scrunchie from her ponytail, performed its elasticity, uh, by pulling both the sides and then replaced it in her hair as a demonstration of the vaginal capacity to stretch. Later, the prosecutor asked nurse Sanchez to address the vagina's self-healing properties. I wanted to talk a little bit about the properties of the vagina as it relates to healing. Is that okay? Yes. How would you characterize the vagina's ability to heal itself? The inner portion of the genitalia has a high vascular component. There's a lot of blood vessels. So there's high blood flow, which allows it to heal very quick, fairly quickly. And when you say fairly quickly, are we talking days, weeks, months, 
And she answered, you know, it can vary from person to person depending on their nutrition, if they have chronic illness, typically depending on the severity of the injury, a very minor injury can take several days. A more severe injury could take a week. It just varies per person. Women's bodies were sites of struggle for representation and control. Scholars have routinely identified persistent negative and false stereotypes of the vagina, including the vagina as inferior, secret, or absent in its relation to the penis, the vagina as a passive receptacle for the penis, the vagina as shameful, unclean, and disgusting, the vagina as vulnerable and abused, and the vagina as dangerous. And you can already hear in terms of the nurses uh, testimony ways in which they uh, kind of uphold some of those uh, forms of knowledge in circulation, but how they also challenge some of them, right? So the vagina as a self-cleaning vessel, right? Pushes back against the notion of something being unclean. Um, the vagina as resilient, um, as uh, vascular and healing, um, and as stretchy, stretchy also challenges this notion of the, vi the vagina as vulnerable. So um, that's you know one of the kind of main interventions that uh, I've noticed is this introduction of the idea of the resilient vagina. While Nurse Sanchez allowed for variations in times of healing, her examples of different nutrition or chronic disease still limited the typical healing times to a single notion of a healthy patient by attributing variation to pathology. The vagina was distinctly gendered as feminine and described in narrow parameters of normal healthy or abnormal unhealthy. Unhealthiness could stem from lack of nutrition. And I you know, just like to share that this is another subtle connection between poverty and in Milwaukee, it's inevitable association with race. Voiced through the white feminized labor of the sexual assault nurse, the normalization of sex bodies reproduced the cultural scaffolding of sexual violence as heterosexual and heteronormative. And I'm reference, referencing Nicola Gabby here. It also generated a dynamic in which white expertise narrated black women's bodies. As ethnographers in the court, you know, we question the purpose of the nurse's demonstratives in our field notes. Why use a scrunchie to illustrate the tensile nature of vascular tissues? Why not a timing belt or a rubber band or some object with a less or differently gendered provenance? The nurse's testimony largely explained why there was nothing to see. In US legal practices, vaginas had been objectified and deemed searchable. For example, when search warrants have been issued to invade a suspect's quote, apartment and vagina. And this is drawn from actual search warrants. Discerning the extent to which a body has been injured, however, required a different medical legal exercise. The injured vagina in these cases was cast as inscrutable, perhaps even dangerous in its secrecy and inability to reveal trauma. The vagina was, perhaps curiously, resilient, reproductive, capacious, yielding, heteronormative, and a slew of other things. The nurses' accounts cast the vagina within a set of institutional categories that were objectifying, even as they qualified the vagina as a worthy legal subject. In her work in Ahmadabad's courts, Pratik Shabaksi has critiqued the long-standing reliance on the medical category of the sexual habitu in India's courts. Bakshi argued that there is no medical knowledge outside the law. It is the law that determines the status of disciplinary expertise. Exemplified for Bakshi in the enduring use of the two-finger test only recently outlawed. This holds true in the context of US sexual assault courts, wherein nurses' descriptions of the vagina contextualize a body that does not give up its secrets through physical evidence. Although rare, on occasion, nurses would sometimes locate micro injuries observable only through techniques of photographic magnification. Micro injuries were sometimes cast as non-conclusive evidence by the prosecutor in opening statements, another nod towards consideration of the forensic examination as a form of corroborative evidence. In opening arguments for State versus Logan, for example, the prosecutor told the jury what was anticipated from the forensic nurse's testimony to come. And the prosecutor said, in addition to hearing from the detective and the officer, you'll hear from the nurse that performed that examination and the medical record of that examination, will, which will be introduced through that nurse. Likely the nurse will say that the examination didn't include something that they refer to as a conclusive, as, as conclusive findings of sexual um, assault. Um, 
And she'll describe to you likely in her testimony that conclusive findings of sexual abuse are extraordinarily rare in her practice and that it's not seen that often. The conclusive finding would be a pregnancy in the juvenile, for example, or possibly a sexually transmitted disease or a complete tear or transection of the hymen. But even that can be caused by other things. But she will note in the medical records here that she did note generalized redness to the six-year-old child's hymen. These forms of illness, redness, small tears or cuts, and other micro injuries were commonly marked onto a body map and preferred as another evidentiary exhibit. This visual representation of the wound, like the unwounded body map pictured before it, remained devoid of its contours and fleshiness. Literally unencumbered by a body, the map focused in on the vulva, a convention of gynecological research and medical textbooks. Photographs of the genital examination, which are often part of the medical charts, were rarely entered as evidentiary exhibits. Many prosecutors found that body maps, helpfully narrated by nurses, were more effective and did not invite the same visceral responses of shame or disgust or revulsion from the jury, a phenomenon that many prosecutors sought to avoid. In interviews, nurses too deliberated on the use of photographic evidence in court. Recall the quote in the previous section about how jurors might interpret a picture of a perfectly normal, healthy area that doesn't look traumatized. The use of body maps over photographs was one more data double, a technique for generalizing the anatomy of assault and erasing the individual victim patient from the proceedings. Now, this figure um, and the previous one that I showed you reference uh, respectively a marked and unmarked body. Um, and the red marks uh, in this rendering, and this is just from my field notes, um, depict injuries found by a sexual assault nurse during one of her examinations uh, that are introduced at trial. This is, it says there you can see exhibit 25 as marked. Um, the, uh, the case uh, comes from um, a trial that I call State versus Peoples, and this is a map that references the medical examination of a 10-year-old girl I call Maya, who I write about at length in other places. Now, I want to draw attention to the fact that there's no representational differentiation between an adult or child patient. The body maps signified the victim's body as the scene of the crime. Genitals were pictured as visible to the eye adding to the perception of the vagina as the penetrable space by either a penis or in this case by the gaze. The flattening of the genital anatomy further contributed to the objectification of the vagina indexed through the spatialization practices of presenting the area as a clock face. So the way this is um, presented by the nurse, she would say that um, the 12 o'clock position is marked at the top of the image um, as are one o'clock, two o'clock and three o'clock respectively with injuries. Much more can be said of um, much more can be said of these mapping practices. But one final point marks the erasure of differently abled bodies, intersexed bodies, culturally marked or modified bodies, and racialized bodies. While most of these cases included black women and girls, each visual rendering defaulted to a white appearing neutral or normalized subject. Along with courtroom observations and extensive interviews with sexual assault nurse examiners, I also attended several local IAFN, International Association of Forensic Nursing, conferences and training seminars to get a broad view of changing practices in forensic nursing. During one such conference at a hotel ballroom, Wanda, an experienced nurse, addressed an audience of rapt forensic nurses. This is a longish quote. And she said, we are being attacked in the courtroom for being CSIs, right? CSIs are crime scene investigators. The newest tactic in defense is if I can make her just an evidence tech and an evidence collector, I can limit her testimony to only what she saw. She can't give an opinion, can't talk about patient demeanor, can't talk about any of those things that might be considered hearsay because hearsay is only allowed to healthcare providers. So they wanna diminish you into being just an evidence collector. You need to be able to articulate that everything I do here is part of my job as a nurse as a healthcare provider, and that you want to be able to speak to that patient's needs, because I'm going to basically show you that genital injury means nothing. It really means nothing. And she continues. And so what are we doing here if genital injury means nothing? 
We can assist the prosecutors by telling them what we saw and how this patient reacted. And that's important. In many ways, it's more important than that two, mil two millimeter laceration. If we can articulate, this is how she was behaving. She was having that post-trauma reaction that I see so commonly with patients. And describe that for the jury and educate the jury because when it comes down to he said, she said, that two millimeter laceration doesn't really mean anything scientifically. Now, Wanda had been a nurse for over 25 years and she informed the audience about the dangers of presenting uh, forensic nursing programs and practitioners as akin to crime scene investigations. Doubling down on the meaninglessness of genital injury and marking the difference between patient care and, and evidence tech, Wanda amplified the narrative role of the nurse, able to quote, assist prosecutors by telling them what we saw and how this patient reacted. Nurses could provide testimony of their visual encounter with the vagina, as well as a clinical account of their patient's expressions of physical pain and trauma. While these expressions were invisible to the jury, they were palpable to the nurse when the patient was before her. Uh, in the example of State versus Moore, the prosecutor asked Nurse Sanchez about the victim witnesses injuries. And the prosecutor said, and you noted the injury was healing. You saw Miss C approximately four days after the assault. Is that correct? Um, and so when you say healing, were they in the process of healing when you saw them? And Nurse Sanchez says, yes, they were not fresh. Normally, if you saw, if we saw what we would call fresh injury, that would show that there was active bleeding. And generally, you can tell if we touch it with a swab, if there's active bleeding, so indicating it was not, it was healing. It was not a fresh wound. And the prosecutor asked, and the abrasion on her left labia minora, would that hurt? And Nurse Sanchez said, yes. And then he also asked about the abrasion on her right labia minora and whether that would hurt. And Nurse Sanchez also said yes. Now in this exchange, the forensic nurse testified to the presence of pain in clinical terms, demonstrating how pain is etched into the medical record she created. In this way, the forensic nurse could report on something a victim witness told her, whereas reported speech would typically be objected to as a violation of hearsay rules. The creation of a medical record and its admission as an evidentiary exhibit allowed the nurse to circumvent such allegations. Pain itself, a symptom that was deemed significant in the clinical encounter, stood in for a discussion of the victim witness's emotional demeanor at the time of the examination. Prosecutors were careful to emphasize words in quotations, indicating verbatim statements from patients. As noted earlier in this talk, nurses rarely commented on the emotional state of the victim witness, limiting themselves to clinical frameworks that evaded the stereotype of feminized caregiver and emotional laborer. Finally, the nurse's testimony in this case situated the victim witness in time, reminding jurors that her body had changed even in the four short days between the assault and the examination. In the case of the sexual assault trial, the notion of vaginal durability or resilience was demonstrated by supplementing jurors' common sense, their mouths, or a stretchy scrunchie, uh, or a rem reminder that women who bear children most often recover from laboring and birthing. Um, and I want to note here that, you know, the scrunchie itself, I, I do consider and categorize a somewhat feminized object. It's much more common to see femmes and women um, wearing them. Um, and um, labor and birthing need not be limited to women, but they are limited to people with uteruses. What I find really interesting about um, supplementing the jurors' common sense with the idea of the mouth and how quickly it can heal is that this is actually an example that um, can cross uh, gender and sexual categories. Um, so I think there's actually something quite clever there. Uh, in the nurse who uses that. Um, so the ways in which nurses demonstrated how a patient's body might endure the violence of rape was nested within how juries also perceived victim witnesses' bodies within a broader context of racialized womanhood. The nurse's explanation of the body's rapid recovery from injury and the anatomical capacity to endure the stress of childbirth are evocative of the ways that Black women's bodies are excluded as vulnerable or fragile in the U.S. popular imaginaries in the afterlife of slavery. And you know, I want to assert this again because the most, uh, you know, more than eighty percent of all of the um, adjudicants, both the defendants and the victim witnesses were uh, black women. Um, 
In the Indian colonial context, returning to Pratiksha Bhakti's work, she's also documented the British juridical practices that deemed working Indian women's bodies as unlikely to be injured, with colonial courts going so far as to argue that women laborers were indubitably so strong that they were unlikely to be raped in the first place. The ostensible physical resiliency of the victim witness's body stands in stark contrast to the emotional fragility many prosecutors hope would comprise the victim witness's testimony. In the courts, I took note of the ceremony of repetition, the formulas preferred when adjudicants were on the record, and the care and thought that attorneys gave to managing the testimony of saints. Our, weekly, our field work frequently circled back to the ways in which forms of knowledge making normalized the absence of injury by scaffolding the findings of a pelvic examination and reinscribing a gendered understanding of the vagina. It is the persistence of the normative approaches to sex and sexuality, as well as the language used by expert witnesses that reproduced problematic descriptions and understandings of the sexual assault victim. These modes mirror Emily Martin's analysis of the romantic language used by scientists when they described the mechanism of fertilization of human sex cells. The conventions of the gynecological examination, such as draping the patient's lower body, were conveyed through the court's practice of witness sequestration, as I already noted, and its use of expert testimony to speak on the victim witness's experience. Just as the patient could not see what the nurse saw during the examination, during the trial, witness sequestration kept the victim witness from hearing how the nurse relayed um, her own examination. In the circumscribed space of a criminal trial, the justice system became one more arena in which the singular experiences of victim witnesses were shaped into familiar and normative narratives of gendered violence. Regardless of the outcome of a legal case, nursing expertise served to impart and normalize medicalizing the vagina itself through a universalized rendering. If medical charts and body maps, DNA analyses, and explanation of the taboo mechanics of the vagina were necessary to understand sexual violence, the penis and other male anatomy were exempt from such incursions. It is worth noting that the nurse's narrative of vaginal durability, resilience, and capacity for healing were perhaps counterintuitive to a jury accustomed to associating femininity with fragility. Nurses' testimony challenged such notions while leaving other normative assumptions in place. In contrast, the victimizing body needed little explanation. It was often left unmarked and unattended. Now, although defendants were silent through most sexual assault trials, their bodies were consistently on display. Due to the US Constitution's due process and confrontation clause, defendants have the right to hear all the evidence against them, to face their accuser, and to remain silent for the duration of the case. Indeed, defendants rarely opted to testify in court. In most sexual assault trials observed, the defendant was remanded and in custody. The courts took great care to hide this fact from the jurors, considering it prejudicial. Appearing in orange jail jumpsuits and shackles during preliminary hearings, defendants changed into plain, uh, civilian clothes for trial. They wore button down shirts, sport coats, or suits brought to the jail or to the court by family members during visiting hours. When no such formal clothing was provided, defense attorneys would acquire secondhand clothing supplied by attorneys or judges themselves, sometimes at a moment's notice. Beyond indications like his clothes, uh, clothing being loose fitting or neckties slack, the jury would not necessarily know that the defendant was in custody. Upon entering the courtroom, wrist ties were removed or cut off by the bailiffs, and defendants were instead restrained with ankle shackles hidden under the defense table and cemented into the floor. Both the prosecutor and the defense tables were draped with floor-length black table skirts to hide the shackles from the jurors. Thus, the change angle when the defendant moved, the judge instructed all present, including us seated in the gallery, not to rise when the court was called to order, leaving the defendant's status um, as imprisoned unknown to the jury. It was common to observe jury members sizing up defendants, sometimes taking quick glances and other times lingering when they thought no one was looking. On occasion, even witnesses would look them up and down, watching their faces for reactions to their testimony. Jurors could only imagine whether the victim witnesses' description of the defendant's actions matched the silent presence sitting before them. Was the defendant capable of carrying out the acts described? Did the defendant now physically and effectively resemble the person described by the victim witness many months? and sometimes years later, earlier. In the case of State versus Mays Sr., the defendant was charged with multiple counts of sexual assault of a child. 
During his trial, Mays decided to testify in his own defense, a rare occurrence and a decision many defense attorneys often advised against. After the guilty verdict was delivered to Mays Sr., we had the opportunity to interview one of the jurors. During our discussion, the juror commented on how the defendant's appearance informed part of her perspective on the case. And the juror said, and the defendant, whoa, the interviewer asked, Mays? And the juror said, huge, yes, Mr. Mays Sr. is huge. And I have to tell you that one of the things, I didn't look at the victim a lot when she was testifying, I looked past her and I was looking at the trees out the window because it was fairly well obvious. It was very uncomfortable as she's talking about very, very specific things. And I wanted to try to say, you know, just listening and taking in the information as I could. And even before he stood up and I realized how big he was, what I thought about when she was describing how when they were having sex and she was on top and he was holding her by the hips, it's like, oh my God, he's using her like a sex doll. That's what it is. She was a living, breathing sex doll for him. And it was disgusting. So he looked presentable. He wore his best clothes, such as they were. The juror described Mr. Mays Sr. as a good-looking, well-dressed, huge man. According to the juror, in comparison to the 13-year-old victim witness who testified to multiple sexual acts uh, during her testimony, his hulking presence solidified for her that he was using uh, this young girl like a doll. State versus Mays Sr. did not include a testifying nurse, any medical personnel, nor a forensic scientist. Although nurses did tell us they were also trained to complete suspect collections and occasionally took photographs of genitalia and other body parts, such orders from police officers were rare. Suspect evidence collection was often focused on recovering suspect DNA to compare with DNA recovered from the victim patient. Descriptions of the defendant's comportment, actions, body, appearance, size, and strength were primarily narrated in relation to the victim witness's body just in like in this case that I just explained. For example, um, in the case of State versus Chandler, the adult victim witness, Sheila Roman, provided the court with an account of the defendant's actions and behaviors and the way he used his body to attack and sexually assault her. The prosecutor asked her what happened and Ms. Roman said, after that, he grabbed my arm. I didn't expect it. I went to get my purse, which was on the floor and he, he knocked me out. He punched me, I didn't expect it. And the prosecutor asked, he punched you where? And she said, on the side of my face, I heard my bones crack. That would be the left side of your face? Yeah, yeah, it's still swollen. How many punches? It was a massive punch, like I was in a car accident. Pointing to her face in order to specify where she was punched, Ms. Roman referenced her own body as evidence of the defendant's violence. Through her testimony, Ms. Roman remained the center of the forensic gaze. The blood from a cut on her face from the defendant's punch, the bruises on her arm, and the insertion of his penis into her vagina were not visualized through the defendant's body. Medical explanations of erections or of the process of inserting a penis into a vagina were unnecessary. The defendant was not deemed worthy of forensic examination, despite the likelihood of bruises to himself and the transfer of blood and other bodily fluids. Rather, it was only through her cooperation with the police investigation and her testimony at trial that the defendant's body was discussed and recorded in court records. Accounts such as Ms. Roman's were common in the courts, describing the act of rape in clinical terms and mimicking the ways in which assaultive behavior was described during forensic examinations. There was no visual representation of the defendant's body, nor further detail solicited about his body from the victim witness. Ms. Roman explained how strong the defendant was, however, and how his punch had broken her tooth. She also explained that he had forced her to wash the evidence off her own body. Victim witnesses frequently narrate these instances of perpetrators' awareness of forensic science. Perpetrators, too, are impacted by the imagined technologies and potential forensic evidence through their efforts to destroy evidence following sexual assaults. It is not uncommon for defense attorneys to cautiously hint towards cultural notions such as the myth of virginity um, during court cases, especially in cases of child sexual assault. Whether these myths made it into court before jurors was largely at the discretion of judges. For example, in State versus King, the state called a pediatrician from Wisconsin's Children's Hospital who had completed a medical examination of the victim witness in the case. The child victim was under 12 and the defendant, King, was charged with assaulting her multiple times. During her testimony, the pediatrician told the jury the child's examination was, quote, normal. 
her hymen was redundant or plump from puberty, and there was some skin irritation. That is, quote, very typical for sexually assaulted children, she continued. About 95% of all kids' exams are normal. The prosecutor inquired, how could that be? To which the pediatrician responded, if there had been an injury, it would have healed quickly, could have healed quickly due to blood supply. So we're back to this vascular tissue. As defense counsel cross-examined the pediatrician, he continually returned to one thing the pediatrician had written um, in her report, that there was, quote, no disruption or tears noted on the hymen. At some point, the judge stopped the cross-examination and released the jury for a break. With the jury out of the room, the judge proceeded to reprimand the defense attorney's style and theme of questioning. The witness seems totally lost, and I suspect that the hymen is perceived to be some sort of magical seal, and it's broken when a woman has sex, and it's not true or a medical fact. From the look on the pediatrician's face, I think the witness knows this too. Medical experts would tell you it breaks for all sorts of reasons, Lord knows. I've heard this from dozens of nurses and doctors as a lawyer and judge. Could a hymen be ripped by exercise, medical exam, conceptual sex? All are possible. So we're getting a little far afield. The defense attorney accepted the judge's reprimand, but the reinforcement of the myth of virginity was not retracted and had already been floated in front of the jury. The reprimand and re redirection, I'll remind you, took place outside of the jury's hearing. More than one case included testimony regarding a defendant's penis. Got to talk about penises now. Recall the earlier discussion about hymens in State versus King. While questioning the victim witness's mother, who testified that she did not believe her daughter was sexually assaulted by her husband, defense counsel established that she and the defendant had been sexually active together. Defense then asked, can you describe for me his penis? Now the judge asked the witness to step down out of the witness box immediately and the bailiffs to remove the jurors from the room. Another protracted discussion ensued between the attorneys and the judge about the imagined size of the defendant's penis. In his argument to the judge, defense counsel indicated that he intended, quote, to elicit that he has a large penis. Judge Van responded, not a chance. That's beyond the pale. I don't care if he's 12 inches, no foundation. It's preposterous. I don't care if he's hung like a horse or a light switch. I have been in this assignment for over three years and never. Defense complained to the judge over three different times that he had to put on a defense for my client, intending to argue that Mr. King's penis was so large that it would have undoubtedly caused damage to the victim's hymen. In addition to witnesses who narrated the defendant's body into the trial, defense attorneys also commented on their client's physical stature and capacities. In State versus Jordan, for example, the defense attorney took to the floor during closing arguments to demonstrate the plank position that he thought his client incapable of of holding due to his client's arthritis. In another case, State versus Jackson, defense counsel argued at great length in closing arguments that his client was slim in stature and the victim witness weighs 206 pounds. So she's not a small person for this guy supposedly pulling her backwards. He can't use his body weight against her any more than when that supposedly happened. Defense questioned how his client of slim build could possibly abduct an unsuspecting woman off the street by running up behind her and pulling her into the back seat of a car. In all these instances, no expert knowledge was required to make the defendant's body legible to the court of law. An often ableist orientation towards masculine violence and the self-evident nature of masculine virility and strength brought the victimizing body into the courts almost wholly through the voices of others. And we're in the home stretch here. So this talk has examined nurses' testimony elicited by prosecutors and defense attorneys in criminal sexual assault trials. I've argued that the raped body is constructed through medical legal imaginaries, heteronormative commitments, and expert knowledges largely used to explain the absence of evidence. The same expert knowledge, however, was silent when it came to narratives of the assaulting body. The self-evident nature of male anatomy reflected a deep genealogy of standards for medical knowledge and education that depict male specimens as normal, while female anatomy is treated as a variant of the species that needs expert interpretation. Nurse testimony explained the inscrutability of the vagina, the reasons why injuries to vaginas are uncommon in sexual assault, and the resilience of female genital anatomy. They also constructed the female body as a heteronormative reproductive body, always already penetrable, regardless of whether the victim testifying was a child, an adult, heterosexual, um, um, non-heterosexual, maternal, or non-maternal. <clears throat> 
In contrast, it is only through lay witnesses that details or commentary about the physical appearance, capability, or anatomy of the defendant was entered into evidence. I've further argued that in the absence of DNA evidence and legible physical evidence of injury, experts testified to the resilience of the female body, objectifying its function using heterosexual reproductive norms and capabilities. Thus, uh, I've reflected on how the feminine body is mapped during trial, while the masculine body seemingly required no such diagramming outside of a mother's drawing, in one case, of her ex-husband's curved penis. That story is in the, the longer version of this talk. This examination invites uh, all of us to think about how men's bodies fit into the heteronormative narratives produced through expert testimony about women's bodies. In the few cases where genital injury was discovered, during a sexual assault forensic examination, nurses magnified what appeared to be minimal injury by emphasizing the rareness of physical injury and testifying to the pain experienced by victims. This pain was most often recorded on medical charts via victims self-reporting according to a subjective pain scale. In an interview, a forensic nurse discussed the possible pitfalls of amplifying genital injury in court. I think that the more that forensic nurses can create a fuller clinical picture of what happens during that encounter and spend less time really focused on the genital injury, the better juries understand the context of the medical evidence. The problem is that when prosecutors put forensic nurses up there and try to highlight the genital injury as being overly indicative of force or sexual assault, they run into trouble there because a good defense attorney will cross on that pretty quickly and often very effectively and make it very clear that those injuries are pretty nonspecific. For nurses on the stand, it was important to move away from a focus on genital injury and yet because of the jury's expectations and defense counsel practices, they were inevitably interpolated into the defense's strategy. Finally, I note the affective qualities that characterize the testimony about victim and defendant bodies. Both the defense and the prosecution drove home the importance of corroboration. Corroboration. The defense, through a concerted effort to focus on inconsistencies within and between narratives, and the prosecution and their work to produce such consistencies. The corroborative practice in part relied on the nurse's testimony who, as a clinician, lent authority to a version of events that was neither consistent nor inconsistent with the complaining witness's testimony. The clinical authority of the forensic nurse was demonstrated through her recording practices, knowledge, and practice with anatomy and plotting injuries onto body maps. As a clinician, she was allowed to voice the victim patient's pain at the time of the forensic examination, documenting patient utterances and testifying to the victim's quoted words in ways that may or may not have reflected the patient's meanings. Between the nurses and other witnesses, a variety of absences were explained away. The lack of injuries, lack of fingerprints, imperfect DNA matches, or the absence of DNA altogether, and delays in disclosure. Whether compelling and insistent or repetitive and tedious, the parade of witnesses who testified to the absence of evidence established that all of these were securely normal. And I thank you so much for listening. <laughs>